Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of How I Do It. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Houle, a neurosurgeon from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and today I'm happy to uh, share the screen with Dr. Vincent Hagel of the Lindau Spine uh, Hospital in Lindau, Germany. Welcome, Vincent. Welcome, Paul, and thanks again for having me for another section of How I Do It. Uh, we had a great one already about cervical, and I'm very, very happy to talk about uh, the resection of an intradural tumor today. Well, this is really exciting because, you know, I've been trying to explain to people um, that, that endoscopic spine surgery is not a procedure. It's a platform and allows us to do a lot of things other than just remove a herniated disc. And I think this is a perfect example of a, of a technique that you can use endoscopic spine surgery with. And uh, I'm, I watched your video that you posted uh, and I was, quite frankly, unbelievably impressed uh, at your skill. Um, and so not only were you able to remove the tumor, but also able to suture the dura, dura which is something that we we're told can't be done, and clearly nobody told you. <laughs> <laughs> so so why don't you tell us a little bit about the patient um, and, and what, what was your thought process in, in wanting to do this surgery endoscopically? Well, yeah. Uh, now, I, I, to be honest, a, a lot of thoughts came to me just retrospectively. Uh, I, I can't really tell you what was the, the complete rationale to decide to do this endoscopically. But when I looked at the MRI, uh, the, for one thing, the size of the tumor, it being not that big, made it for me reasonable to, to try to remove it endoscopically because I think size does to some extent play a role. Also the location within the spine, within the dura, uh, it being more dorsally located, uh, made it to me easier to remove with a posterior approach than like, yeah, ventrally located meningiomas or so. And uh, one big decisive factor was the, the location right behind the L1 vertebral body, but uh, more or less beneath the lamina. Now, I have done quite a few translaminar approaches for discectomies before. And so I thought this is exactly the location where I would choose a translaminar approach if it were a herniation upward migrated. And so I thought this is a, a good approach to, to this tumor as well uh, with the rationale to keep the approach as minimal invasive as possible. I mean, the question of course is what could be a possible benefit compared to microsurgery? What is the reason why I should do this endoscopically? Why, how can the patient benefit from it? And so I thought if I preserve the facet joint, if I preserve more or less the, the function, the stability of it, I might, uh, yeah, create a long-term benefit for the patient because we all know at the thoracal lumbar junction, if you do a laminectomy, that might impair uh, function stability, cause long-term back pain. And uh, I'm sure many, many colleagues would have done this with a laminectomy, possibly beyond the one level uh, if, if it were done microscopically. And so I thought a uh, big point would be a benefit in the approach apart from removing the tumor. Of course, I had uh, doubts about being able to completely remove the tumor endoscopically. And of course, I was uh, at any given point of time, ready to convert to microsurgery, but obviously it worked to where uh, I could remove it more or less completely if if I trust the post-operative MRI. You know that's such a good point because you know we have you know these techniques in our armamentarium, but the real question is you know what benefit to the patient, and I think you just explained that beautifully. Well, you know before I. Uh, decided to, to give it a try, I of course looked into literature and uh, I mean, over the years I've heard of very, very few uh, cases where somebody uh, removed a tumor full, fully endoscopically, but still I tried to get any kind of information before I, I did that myself. But 
well, not so much surprisingly, but there is very little literature about full endoscopic removal of intradural tumors. As far as I could uh, find with my yeah knowledge of research, there is only one study from India out of, I think, 2018, comparing 15 microendoscopic cases versus 16 full endoscopic cases. The summary more or less is that endoscopy is safe and effective to remove it. And beyond that, I only could really find uh, one case report from Professor Senturk from Turkey, also removing a L1 intradural mass lesion. That's but funny. You know, in, that, preparation, in preparation for this, I actually did the same literature search and found essentially what, what you found. And there really is not a lot out there. There's this one, the one case report. And uh, I think, you know, in seeing what you, what you posted before, your description um, and how you do it, I think the video medium is going to be a really nice way for people to see um, how to do uh, this procedure. Exactly. And so, uh, of course, before I start this procedure, I, I went through the different steps. And, and obviously, uh, despite that there's very literature there, of course, I, I didn't really have a way to, to know that the different steps would work. For instance, the, the slide that we see right there is the opening of the dura. Obviously, there is no instrument made to intentionally open the dura more so you're always concerned about accidentally doing that but uh, there is yeah, we no, have no we instrument. have lots of instruments that accidentally open the dura right <laughs> and and so i was talking to the to the nurse in my or and we were thinking about different options of how to do that and eventually came up with this compromise right there where i just took a blade uh, actually from the ent colleague and and uh, yeah grabbed it with the with the forceps to open it it worked obviously quite nicely but um, also as as i have more slides to it could you just go back next, to that could you just go back to yeah. that for just one second so yeah. just for our viewers so he's already done you've already performed a standard um uh, endoscopic uh hemilaminectomy i assume you use the high uh, a burr a drill and in right, this particular right. case you're using the joymax uh Alesis pro set correct Exactly, exactly. So the yeah. Alesis Pro is a slightly larger diameter than the TESIS set and slightly smaller diameter than the um, the uh, standard Alesis uh, set. So this has an outer diameter of about a centimeter, correct? Well, the, the Alesis Pro is, is a little bit smaller. It's uh, 7.3 millimeter. The Alesis Delta is Delta. a little bit bigger. And I was actually having that system just as the thesis system uh, ready to to use as well uh, because of course again i didn't know which one would be the most suitable one and i did in between especially for suturing the dura change to the thesis system but then went back to the elasis within the procedure so yeah most of the procedure i did with the elasis pro yeah and so he, you've already performed your laminotomy and you also perform a, a bit of a sublaminar decompression as well to fully expose the dura correct right correct yeah all right so go ahead and move to the you were showing the dural opening right now apart from not knowing how to open the dura which retrospectively obviously worked quite well my next uh, concern was how do i retract the dura because in microsurgery you do these tack up stitches uh, which keep the dura uh, apart but uh, you can't really do that i mean i wasn't so much concerned about how to to place the tack up stitches because obviously it worked uh, with the dural closure but where would I tie them to? Obviously, I just have bone all around um, and no muscle anywhere close to or any other soft tissue to tack it to. So, yeah, again, the thoughts I had uh, were to, to use a working uh, sleeve with a, like, which is beveled quite a bit to where I can use that lip to retract the dura. But again, I, of course, didn't know if that's, uh, at all possible without accidentally compressing the fascicles, uh, but that certainly did work quite quite well at the beginning, at least until I could get the tumor out of the dura. 
So what you're saying is, is that you utilize that beveled edge of the tubular retractor to get inside your dural opening to provide you some uh, retraction. Is that correct? Right. That's why also I intentionally made the dural incision more medial, like medial to the tumor. So I will w could be able with the the bevel to put that edge to to retract the dura to like to towards lateral and thereby expose the tumor. So the question that everyone's going to ask is about water pressure and the fact that this is under um, you, there's water flowing through here. You have a dural opening. What's the chances of of putting too much water intradural and causing spinal headaches and, and complications afterwards. Yeah. It was certainly a concern of mine as well. And I was uh, throughout the whole procedure, of course, trying to keep the, the pressure and the flow setting as low as possible. I used my standard settings uh, just as with any other lumbar procedure of uh, around 30 to 40 pressure and flow setting. And I used the, the Troymax Versicon where, of course, you can also uh, adjust the level. So I felt, yeah, pretty safe with those settings. Uh, right. so I was apart from our viewers, no, just I want, for our viewers uh, who may not be familiar um, with the Joymax system, you're able to adjust the pressure, and typically we keep the water pressure below the diastolic blood pressure. So that's a, a feature I think that's very important and something that should be noted. Exactly. And also, I was a little bit concerned about epidural bleeding because when once the dura is open, the CSF flowing out and the intradural pressure reduces, you have to usually struggle with these epidural bleedings. And that's, of course, why usually in microsurgery, you, you just fill this epidural space with, yeah, surges all and so on. And obviously, I didn't put anything there. But that worked quite well. Also, I, I didn't have any any issue with epidural bleeding right there. Uh, and retrospectively, uh, I'm pretty sure that there was less CSF lost through this procedure than would have been in microsurgery, just due to the irrigation, you know, creating this counter pressure. And of course, it's just one case, but I was really amazed about the great shape that patient was in immediately after surgery. After microsurgical tumor resections, these patients usually take quite a few days to, to get back to a normal shape, which I associate with the loss of CSF. But this patient, she was already the first day after the surgery as if it had been just a standard discectomy. Uh, like I said, I mean, just more out of uh, fear, I did mobilize her within the first 24 hours. But after those 24 hours, she got up and like I have also mentioned or wrote in the in the video, no headache at all, no complication, nothing. And like I said, I associate that with less loss of CSF. But on the long run, of course, we have to look into these specific complications of endoscopy, as you have mentioned, seizure, severe headache. And as far as we don't know the clear association, yes, it's certainly advisable to keep the pressure and the flow as low as possible. And this is a great view. I mean, you can see the tumor there or right above your description or lateral. Um, it's just an incredible view. Yeah. Even like when I opened the door and saw this vessel right there and uh, as you can also see, hopefully, is that the arachnoid is still intact right there. So with this close and, and clear and detailed view, you can really work very precisely. Uh, and, and I think that's probably one benefit of it. Also, you can easily move the endoscope in any kind of direction. And you have this 15 degree off axis view, which to me, uh, creates uh, possibly a benefit over microsurgery. I mean, if with the microscope you're so concentrating using both hands, you always think twice before you move the microscope. And, and therefore, I think using the endoscope, it gives you much more mobility and adaptability to, to get always the best view.
No, that's uh, excellent. Do you have a video to show us? Well, uh, I, I don't really accept the one, of course, that I've posted at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. uh, which is already a short version. Uh, I have a, the long 10 minute version posted on uh, YouTube where I mainly just more extensively show the dual closure, the, the suture where I started trying to push down the knot with forceps and dissector, which didn't work. But then again, the, the nurse at the OR showed me this knot pusher from the general surgery colleagues, which then worked quite nicely. But also at the LinkedIn video, uh, Dr. Asus asked about the knotting of, of, of the sutures. And yes, I did uh, like suture and, and pull the, the suture all the way out of the endoscope and do the knotting outside before I then push down the knot with this knot pusher. And of course, I've thought about how to do that for several hours before the procedure because I thought I can't try to remove the tumor endoscopically and then use the microscope to suture the dura because as you've mentioned at the very beginning uh, so far we always tell colleagues beginners and so on that it's not possible to do that endoscopically and so I've had different uh, scenarios in mind to where all the way to I use the the, the elasis delta working sleeve which has of course a bigger diameter than the one with the elasis pro but still use the elasis pro endoscope and beside the endoscope like between the endoscope and the working tube go down with my uh, thread and then suture it that way which is what i tried at the beginning but the problem is since it's a monofilament uh, thread it, it broke uh, when i yeah more or less compressed it a little bit with the tip of the endoscope so that first uh, scenario that i had in mind obviously didn't work but then i was surprised that the needle that i used fit through the uh, working channel of the endoscope which was of course then uh, the way to do it but uh, i think so what, what size suture was it it was what size suture uh, uh, i used the seven seven oh seven oh uh, but I, I didn't try. Uh, I think I did have a five or six O uh, in the in the room as well. But um, I just went with the seven O, which worked nicely. Maybe the needle of even a six or five O would would fit through it. Through I, I haven't tried it. All right. So this is uh, control once I established my approach and. Uh, the rationale was to remove not all of this part of the lamina right here, but leave uh, at least remnants of it in order to preserve its function and stability. As we will see uh, with the post of control, I couldn't manage to keep a, a rim of bone up here. Otherwise, I could not have exposed the upper end of the tumor. But still, as we will see, I've preserved the facet joint, quite a bit of the isthmus right here. So I'm hoping that this will still yeah, preserve the, the function and stability on the long run. So as we've said earlier, I just more or less uh, used the, the shrill, the Joymax shrill, the diamond burr to make a hole in the lamina. But like I said, try to preserve as much bone around to keep its stability. And specifically what, and burr, what burr did you use? The 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 four point five millimeter diamond burr. Excellent. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the shrill, it's an endoscopic drill. You have multiple different choices of burrs. Um, he used a four point five millimeter diamond burr, which is actually very safe around the dura. Um, there's also acorn burrs and more aggressive burrs, some of which can be um, used to can protect uh, the dura. Um, oh, actually, you have a nice view of that. Yeah. And you see the Dora already shining through out there. So there's really it's just a very, very thin layer of bone left right there. But as you've said, the diamond burr is safe to where you can even shrill really close to the to the Dora without usually injuring it. All right. So once I've exposed the Dora, then uh, I started to very superficially, carefully, step by step uh, incise it. And right there, we already see the arachnoid beneath it, as well as this uh, vein right there. But again, with this very close view 
already preserving the arachnoid at all times, uh, I'm sure that's a, a very safe way to, to open the door. Now, in the full version at YouTube, you can also see how I put some cotton oil protection right beneath the door when I extended cranial to still be on the safe side, just as we know that from microsurgery. And then uh, once I have uh, opened it, I use, as we've also said, the edge of the bevel right there to retract the dura, and that exposes the tumor right down here. So once I've exposed the caudal and cranial edge of it, I try to mobilize it and again, uh, partially retracting the dura right there with my working tube. Yet, of course, you have to always be careful to not compress the fascicles right there. And uh, obviously that worked quite well to just with this nerve hook, carefully mobilize it, use also dissectors and uh, different instruments to cut these small membranes where the tumor was attached to the fascicles. And then, of course, something that I didn't plan to do in advance was to mobilize this tumor out of the dura, which was, I think, the, the key to, to the success of it, because from there I could use different instruments, again, like the forceps, the two hairs right there, to debolt the, the tumor, which gave me a better view on the ventral part of it in order to dissect it from the fascicles right there. At that point, it was pretty clear to me that it is a neuronoma because you see the different filaments of these fascicles mm -hmm. running in and around the tumor. Now, as Dr. Coroneus from Brisbane, Australia, uh, commented on the LinkedIn video, he said at this stage right here, in this moment, he did have some palpitations with the fascicles uh, coming out of the dura. Of course, I certainly did have those palpitations myself. Um, but that was really the last step to, to complete this procedure endoscopically by dissecting and cutting these last filaments right there. And again, if you just uh, pay attention to the close uh, and clear view, I'm sure that is a big, big benefit compared to microstructure because I don't think you can ever get this clear close view. Also slightly looking around the corner with this off axis view to really do these precise uh, movements right there. Yeah, I think so that's a clear, to... distinct uh, advantage there, even with microsurgery, is with that 30-degree that angled view, you can really look up and behind, and I think that's really uh, important. Yeah. Wow. Look and now, that. once the, the tumor was out, uh, we still see most of the fascicles intact. I mean, there are really very, very few small filaments right there, which I had to sacrifice to, to detach the tumor. Of course, at that stage, I possibly expected some hopefully only mild deficits, but uh, as I've mentioned before, I'm so surprised because she did not have any, any deficit at all postoperatively, but certainly it would have not been too surprising if she did have some. I mean, I wouldn't have expected major ones because still most of the neural structures right there are completely intact. And despite manipulating on them a little bit, uh, I don't think there was too much traction on it. And again, I believe that the, doing this procedure underwater because you have this continuous irrigation throughout possibly also is, is beneficial to these fascicles right there instead of in microsurgery, of course, where the assistant or whoever uh, continually irrigates, it's not the same as doing this under endoscopic irrigation where you keep really the whole surgical field underwater all, at all time. So once the, the tumor was removed, of course, uh, the big question was how to close the dura. And uh, so overall, of course, it's just a very short sequence right here, but it took me about 40 minutes to get all that done. But uh, like I've mentioned, there was quite a bit of learning curve in it as well, because I've never done this before. And also, as mentioned before, the first uh, one that I did, I didn't have this knot pusher yet, so it was quite a hassle to do that. Once I've uh, gotten that, it was much easier to tie these knots down there. And at uh, this stage, you see that 
having put some tachosil also in between, now the dura is pulsating, which is at least to some extent the sign that it is watertight. So I was quite happy to at least get it done to that extent. Now, apart from judging the tumor removal, which the radiologist judged as being completely removed, my big question, of course, was if it is watertight, uh, if the dura is closed watertight. Now, the radiologist isn't sure if that is CSF. He said it's definitely not absolutely could be, but not, not he, he's not completely sure about it. But I think uh, it's not that big of a question if there is some CSF uh, leaking, because we all know if we have dural tears or small dural tears in endoscopic spine surgery, there's no need to, to close that because despite CSF uh, flowing out, it still stays within the area. It, I've never seen it uh, move all the way up to the skin, which is where the problem starts when you have this fistula line, you have the possibility of, of creating an infection and so on. So even if it is a little bit of CSSF, I'm not too worried about it because uh, as I've also mentioned in the, in the video at the very end in the summary, that the uh, patient has been up after 24 hours out of bed and she has never complained about the slightest bit of headache. So that would have been my other concern with uh, CSF loss that she's, she's developing headaches, but like I said, she did not at all. No, that's remarkable. Yeah, I mean, we all see that, you know, even with uh, tubular surgery, the, their dural tears are just does something very different than with open surgery because there's just simply no dead space. So, I mean, that could just be some saline that was left in the tube left behind as well. Yeah. So. I'm, I'm sure some of the irrigation just yeah flows along the adjacent and, levels. It mixes, and it it mixes have... with some of the blood and gives it that appearance. Right, right. So I'm, of course, going to be very eager to see the the uh, MRI in yeah about three months. But mm -hmm. uh, right now, I'm very confident that it will it will be okay. Well, that's uh, and also quite I, I do have I do ha have uh, apart from this satchel for you right here also the the post-op uh, x-ray which I did just out of curiosity to to check the extent of decompression and despite like I've said I had to sacrifice this last rim of bone up here to be able to reach the upper border of the tumor there is obviously still quite a bit of lower part of the lamina right here preserved as well as here on the side the isthmus so of course, the question is if that is biomechanically stable, but having still this piece of bone, I'm pretty sure that it will preserve the function and stability of the facet joint, which, in my opinion, would be really a great advantage on the long run, because this patient, she's only 47 years old, so uh, having preserved this facet joint, I'm sure is going to be a big benefit for her on the and long run. And not only that, you've preserved the interspinous ligament. You've preserved all the multifidus muscles, so all the support structures for the joint and the spine are, are intact. So I think that's a really sound premise and I, I think a really good execution. Yeah. Well, that was, uh, that was really fantastic. It just sort of shows what you can do uh, with an endoscope, and you certainly pushing the boundaries and expanding uh, our horizons on what we can do with uh, endoscopic spine surgery. Yeah, it was it was really uh, despite or yeah, I mean, there's little literature, obviously, but still, it's not that you're doing something that's well established. And, and as you've seen, as I've mentioned, uh, I've done different steps, which obviously have not been done before to where I had to find a, a way or a solution to even get it done. Uh, it's it's certainly very exciting, and uh, I'm not sure how it will develop in the future. I hope uh, more and more cases will create literature to where this is something that is an alternative to, to microscopic uh, surgery. Uh, but as, as promising as this first case uh, was, we will certainly have to, to rely on, on science on the, on the long run to see if there's the benefit of it. But uh, like I said, it's it's very exciting to, yeah, blaze this new trail to some extent, and 
Uh, I'm, of course, hoping very much that this will be a technique um, alternative and just as as high quality to microsurgery in the future. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right because if you look at our history, you know, one of the great advancements in our field was the use of the operating microscope and that allowed us to do things that we couldn't do before. And now here you're combining endoscopic techniques that not only cause less uh, destruction of normal anatomy, but also I would say probably gives you a better view. Uh, and as we develop better instruments that are more suited to taking out tumors where you don't have to cobble together instruments from other services, I think that, you know, not only do we have a technique, but we'll have a system to be able to do this. And, you know, I can foresee this being something uh, that many surgeons will be able to adopt into their practice. So you're to be congratulated. You're a true pioneer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that, you know, I, I completely agree with that because... I think concerning the technology, there is a limitation to it. And it might even be that uh, biportal endoscopy will be more suitable to remove these tumors. And it's, it's very interesting because, you know, I started endoscopic spine surgery in 2018. And whenever I talk to colleagues who have done it for years and years longer than I do, uh, it's very difficult for me to understand that they are talking about a different technology or at least a very uh, limited technology once they started. And I think it's comparable uh, right now concerning the, the resection of a tumor because uh, we don't have instruments that are made for removing the tumor. Just that, that one slide where I showed this, these scissors. I mean, they are, uh, of course, way bulkier than micro scissors that you know uh, from microsurgery to, to remove tumors. But on the other hand, I think it's an exciting field for, for industry to, to develop instruments that are suitable to remove tumors, making it a much more effective procedure to fully endoscopically remove those. And so, yeah, I think that's exciting times ahead. Yeah, I agree. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, this case with us. I think there's a lot of uh, spine surgeons and endoscopic spine surgeons who are going to find this incredibly interesting and, and hopefully will be inspired to uh, attempt uh, this for their patients. So uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Paul, for having me. And yeah, it's, I mean, of course, overall, it's still compared to, to disc herniations, uh, a rare pathology. So it will certainly take multi-center studies to to get good data out of it. And I was certainly overwhelmed by the positive feedback that I got on, on the, on LinkedIn. Well, so, well, thank you very, very much for sharing. This has uh, been, been illuminating. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And I'm excited for more, how I do it sessions. And I think uh, dorsal closure will be a very exciting other one.